United Methodist Church of Claremont, Florida. We are going to praise our Lord today here and at home. So if you would use this time, let us stand up and we are going to worship with O Come, All Come. And if we can't sing, we can certainly lift our hands and we can praise together. church you may be seated and let's say hello to everyone online good morning church and wow it is so great to see all of you here today too we are just so grateful that we are still able to meet because this is a crazy time this is a very crazy time amen it's so crazy my my four-year-old came home from school last week and he said mom someone tried to hug me but don't worry I told him I don't do hugs I was like, please tell me you told them because of the virus. Okay, but it's crazy, and it is crazy for all of us. Even our kids are being affected, but we thank you because we do have to wear the masks um, the entire time that we're in the building from covering the face, the entire nose and mouth, and that's what allows us to continue to worship. We also did give everyone here a Connect card, so we do ask that you fill out your name and a contact information in case we need to inform you of anything about this service later, but we also use that opportunity to ask you for a prayer request if you would have one you can put that on the card or if you have a question about anything coming up but also you'll have a place to put that on the way out there'll be a box and we'll collect all of those there online we want to connect with you too so if you want to email us at we care the email address is we care at f-u-m-c dash claremont Dot org. We also want to connect, so let us know if you would like a phone call or if you have a prayer request or, or anything else we might be able to do for you. But here's the thing. We know, especially you guys online, this, a lot of you, most of you are online, and a lot of you here, we're all feeling weird. We're all feeling crazy. A lot of you are feeling disconnected. 
we are taking We Care to a new level, the We Care ministry, and we are going to intentionally, over the next year, connect with our congregation on the phone. So we want to invite you to be part of this ministry. If you're at home and you're feeling disconnected, you can serve from home, and all of you as well. If you're interested, just give us an email or write on the Connect card. We're going to divide our congregation into groups of 10 or 20 people and put a shepherd over them that throughout the next year you can call and connect and just listen to somebody that might just need an ear that you can pray for them. We'll train you on how that goes, but um, we do wanna invite you to be part of that. We also have information on the website. But for Christmas coming up, a couple of announcements I wanna make sure everyone knows. What are we doing? This Thursday, we're gonna kick off our season with our blue Christmas service. It'll be in this building at seven o'clock, and we also will live stream it on our Celebrate Recovery page, but it's for anyone that just needs a little hope. If you're feeling hurt, if you're feeling lost, we wanna offer this service for you at seven o'clock. We used, used to, or we wanted to have Campfire Christmas on the 18th, but we've decided to postpone that event um, because the purpose of that event is fellowship. So we wanna do that in the, in the next year, January, February, when we're able to get together. It'll be a Campfire event, so just stay tuned for those details. Christmas Eve, we will have opportunities for those online. If you would like to watch, we're gonna have a traditional and a separate contemporary service that we will be broadcasting throughout the day. And you can watch that on YouTube or through Facebook. But also, we will have outdoor experience at 12, 2, and 4. You can pick a service. They're gonna all be the same, and it's going to be outside in the parking lot of the Wesley Center. Bring your lawn chairs, bring the kids. You're gonna be in a six foot from each other little space that we're gonna mark out so it'll be socially distanced. Masks are encouraged. So you can do with that what you like, but it will be outside, it will be spaced out. We're very excited about that. Um, but that's why we're here. You know, we're here because Jesus, no matter what we're going through, Jesus brings us true hope, peace, joy, and love like never before. And so as we, through this Advent season, anxiously and expectantly wait for the arrival of Jesus Christ, we lit the candle already of hope. We lit the candle of peace. And today I'm gonna light the candle of joy. together. Our eternal God, our Lord, our Redeemer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. As we come together wherever we are, either here in person or watching abroad, we know, Lord, that you are with us all. And Lord, we come to you out of faith, remembering with hope how you promised the world a savior. And when Jesus was born, the Prince of Peace gives us peace beyond comprehension. And today, we stand in joy that no matter what is going on in our circumstances, your joy is constant, it's continual, it's everlasting and it's here with us now. So Lord, we lift you, we praise you, we thank you for you are the reason we are here. You're the reason we worship. You give us everything we need. And so now Lord, we come as we pray out loud the way you taught your disciples. We pray that way now, the Lord's prayer. Our Father 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we stand in awe in this time of thanksgiving and praise where we get to honor the Lord and worship and thank him for all that he continues to do. And for all of you and you online as well who've been giving faithfully as God gives to us faithfully, we wanna say thank you. We are coming to the conclusion of this year. I did wanna say a lot of lives have been changed. We can probably spend the next hour going through all the mouths that have been fed through this church, all the cold people that have been given warmth and especially all of you thinking, wanna thank you too for the toys and the donations for Miracle, or I'm sorry, Spirit of Christmas. We did help over 62 families with gifts for their children, uh, or 62 children, so it was amazing that we were able to do that despite a pandemic. So we wanna thank you for the gifts, and as we continue to end this year strong with our giving, you can give online, you can give on the website, or if you brought gifts here today, we will have a basket on the way out. But for all of this, we come to just thank our Lord. We also are excited because we are still doing ministry. The children ministry is back in swing, and they, are, they were at capacity today, um, reservations only. So if you do have grandkids, make sure you make that reservation. Our youth have been meeting Sundays at 3.30, which we're excited today. Our director of youth ministries, Mac, is bringing in the word today. So we want to welcome him. And um, I'll be going, and this is not me skipping out, but I get the honor of preaching today at the Awaken service, which is going on next door. And they, um, you know, they're at 11.11, a brand new service we launched three years ago. So if you see me head out, that's where I'm headed. But right now, we're just here together to just honor and worship God. So thank you to our joy singers, Vern and Jeannie. Let us just continue praising the Lord. We are waiting, we are waiting for the coming King. Waiting, we are waiting for the bells of heaven to ring. When the valleys rise up and the mountains lie down, Savior's gonna come to claim His heavenly crown.
Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you guys are doing well this morning. Um, let me just tell you, when they told me I had to speak on joy this week. I said, it's going to be a joy just to be back with the 11 o'clock crowd. And 8 o'clock, because I know you guys are in here too. Um, and I was, I was thinking to myself, how long has it been? How long has it really been? And I really don't know, but it's been too long. I know that much. Um, so I am really, really joyous and really, really excited to share with you guys this morning and continue on in our Advent series um, as the, the band, as everybody just played so beautifully, that we are in this season of waiting, right? And, and it's been further than just Advent that we've been waiting. All of you guys know that. Uh, we've been waiting for quite some time, uh, waiting for normalcy, waiting for connection, waiting for community, waiting for family. We've been waiting on a lot of things, and we know that waiting is hard. But in the midst of a season that's marked by waiting, we also have this focus on hope, we have a focus on peace, and today we get to talk, we have a focus on joy. And so what does it look like to wait with joy? I guess that's the, that's the opening question, and, and I guess the more that I kept diving into the scriptures, I had the, glor- the, the awesome opportunity a couple of weeks ago to speak at uh, the other services on hope. And, and there's some things about hope that I'm sure is going to get brought in today, today's message, but I just realized that as you wait... And as you are, are, are sitting here, if you, if you guys can think about the people of Israel and what they've been waiting for, they've been waiting for a lot. They've been waiting upon prophecy, upon prophecy, upon, uh, upon all these situations, all these probabilities that are out there, all these, all these outcomes that they want to see happen in what could come with the Messiah. And then hope is born in the, in, in, in the form of an infant. And so we already know that if that's the story that we're going to be diving into, then there is something that we can learn about how to wait. And so today, as we look at joy, uh, my first question I have for you is, have you ever been surprised before? Anybody here ever had someone throw them a surprise party? Maybe you had a gift that was a surprise. Um, Funny enough, uh, I, I feel like I had never really had a surprise party before. I had helped my friends throw some surprise parties. But recently in this year, a couple of my friends that I uh, have in town just decided that a very, very small get-together with the people that we eat dinner with, so to speak, would throw me a surprise party. And I just remember walking in and being absolutely dumbfounded at this group of people who decided that the theme of the party was just going to be to dress like different versions of Mac. Um, and so we had someone, yeah, and, and it's kind of crazy that they could even do that. They had some people dressed up as, as me like in tree lot form, some people dressed up as me in, in youth pastor form, and then even today, uh, the sport coat that makes it out like twice a year. Um, <laughs> someone was dressed in a sport coat with a little microphone pack on. Um, and I said, I only wear this thing for the 11 o'clock service. You guys should know that. But I just remember being so shocked. And I remember having this weird feeling of, of absolute certainty that this group of people loved me, that they, that they cared for me, and that they, they wanted me to experience this surprise, and they were excited to give it to me. And I ask you, have you ever been surprised? Because I believe what we're going to look at today is we're going to see that joy is the outcome of watching Christ surprise people. That joy, and that this season of waiting, that as we wait upon something, we're always trying to predict what it is that we're waiting upon. And think about how many times we thought we knew when everything would open up. Think about how many times we thought we knew when we'd be able to be with people again. Think about how many times we thought we knew when we get to go to that restaurant that we wanted to go to. And and we start to predict, we start to try and and create the probability of what the outcome will be so much in our life that I think we don't always open ourselves up to the opportunity for God to surprise us. And so today, all I'm going to look at is just three different scriptures, three different parts of the Advent story in which I believe surprise is God's main goal. And my hope and my prayer is that today as we listen, as we dive into his word, that you guys would open yourself up to the possibility that maybe, just maybe, you don't have it figured out. And maybe, just maybe, this waiting thing is something we still need to get better at. And maybe, just maybe, God wants to surprise all of us in different ways if we would just open our minds up to it. Even when I was thinking about the pattern of people, I started thinking about videos. Any of you guys watch like soldiers coming home um, or engagement videos? They're all over the internet now, right? Or people surprising someone with a gift. Um, There's an emotion attached to it. 
And I'm not much of a mush. Um, I'm, I'm not one that just cries very easily, but you put a cu- couple Publix commercials on during the holidays, or you, put, <laughs> or you put a couple soldiers coming home from war, and you'll see the waterworks start coming, right? And so this emotion that I believe is invoked through surprise is the same th- goal that God has in this Advent season. And so if you guys have your Bibles, you can turn. Uh, We're going to be starting today's scripture in Luke. Uh, And I want to tell you guys a little bit about Zechariah and Elizabeth. Okay, Zechariah and Elizabeth would be John the Baptist's parents. Okay, And at this time, Elizabeth is old in her age. She is far older than what you would normally be bearing a child at. And so the angel Gabriel, before he ever visits Mary, and that's the story we know, angel angel Gabriel coming to Mary, right? And we're going to get into that later today too. He actually goes to Zechariah first. And he gives Zechariah some news that Zechariah is not ready to hear. And he's not ready to hear it, not because he doesn't want to hear it, but because he just thinks there's no possible way it could be true. And so if you guys are are in your Bibles, I want you to to start, we're going to start in verse 11 of Luke 1. And it says this, It says, and there appeared to him, this is Zechariah, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was was troubled when he saw him, and he fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you you will have joy and gladness, hear that, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready for all, to to make ready for the the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. That's a kind of a dig, you know? And the angel answers him. (laughs) That's a nice way to say that. I'm advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this news. So we have Elizabeth and Zechariah, who are advanced in their years, right? Not expecting that a child could be brought to them even though they've been praying for it. Did you catch that? Angel Gabriel greets Zechariah and says, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. And I wonder how long before that, Zechariah gave up on that prayer. And I don't know about you, but something that I've learned in a season of waiting and in a season of uncertainty and in a season of weird is that one thing I need to get better at is praying consistently. Because I think I'm really good at praying for something when it's an immediate need. And I think I'm really good at praying for something, uh, praying bold prayers when I feel like I really, really need to hear from the Lord. But after a certain amount of time, that doubt does creep in. And after a certain amount of time, that effort for that one specific prayer does start to subside. And I wonder, I I just want to know what it would look like if a community of people consistently prayed for something continuously. I, I think when you hear people, people say pray unceasingly, that's what it means. That you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray, not waiting for the result, but you pray knowing that you're praying to a promise keeper and to a promise maker. And I believe that there was a point in this story where Elizabeth and Zechariah still believe in the faithfulness of God, but they've kind of given up on the prayer. And so Gabriel comes to greet him. He says, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. And how does Zechariah greet Gabriel, with doubt, with shock, with misunderstanding. What does he say? He says, uh, how shall I know this? How shall what you're telling me be true? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. There's no way, Gabriel. We're far outside this childbearing years. There's no way that this can happen. I think it's in seasons of waiting we're called to remember. And crazy enough, when you do a word study on, on Zechariah's name, Zechariah's name means God remembers. The name Zechariah in Greek means God remembers. And the name Elizabeth in Greek means God promises. Do you want a word this Christmas season? 
The word is that God remembers God's promises. Zechariah and Elizabeth may have forgotten, but God remembers God's promises. And he promised them a child. And he promised them a great child. And, and Gabriel here is here to tell them that John is going to do astounding things. And we know that John goes on to be this one who prepares the way for the Lord, who prepares the way, who says, I am just a voice in the wilderness crying out, prepare the way. And so joy comes to them. That Gabriel tells them before they even experience that joy, that joy is going to come to you. But isn't it crazy that the first place that we see joy come in the New Testament, in the, in the story of Christ, is it comes through a surprise. It comes through a shock in all experience. It comes through someone saying that we know better and God saying, no, you don't. That when Zechariah and Elizabeth had already kind of chalked it up as an L, that we are not going to have a child, that that is not going to happen, but we are still going to faithfully follow God, God comes into the picture and says, no, 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 no. I have far more for you than you could have expected. You just have to be open to the surprise. Joy comes in remembering that God remembers. But the human response is, is always the same to surprises, right? But even when I was surprised at that birthday party, I just said, how? How'd you guys do this? Why is my little sister here? She doesn't even live in town. <laughs> I was like, how did you guys do this? And, and you kind of have this sense of, of, well, the notion, the ex expectations, the things that I have already planned in my head are not being seen by what's in front of me when a surprise happens. And so there's this, this period of time where we have to eliminate our expectations if we actually want to be willing to experience surprise. I mean, even just think about 2020 in general. How many expectations did you have for this year? This is, this, is, this is kind of a funny thing. It's actually just a, a meme. It's a, a funny picture that someone posted on Facebook, but I had to read it, right? 2020 had so much potential. Let me just read to you the 2020 holiday schedule, okay? In 2020, Valentine's Day was on a Friday, right? Yeah, come on. You can't set that up more perfectly. Uh, February had 29 days. I don't know why that's so important, but it was in the picture. Cinco de Mayo was on Taco Tuesday, literally. <laughs> Seriously, it was, it was. Fourth of July was on a Saturday. Halloween was on a Saturday. The kids could trick or treat. You didn't have to worry about the time, all that stuff, right? Christmas this year is beginning on a Friday, something we always want, a three-day weekend for Christmas, right? It just works out perfectly. And then New Year's, New Year's weekend, we get to celebrate with three days, a three-day weekend, right? 2020 had all of this potential. So much. You can just look at the picture and say, man. But we have to understand that joy is not motivated by potential. And we have to understand that God is not in the business of just looking at potential. God is in the business of supplying a promise. And in this season, I want you guys to know that we might have marked potential and we might have placed expectations, but I do believe that God has a plan and a promise to far exceed those expectations. A promise that, 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 that is going to redeem those expectations. And I do believe that if we would open ourselves up to it, that he really, really wants to surprise us still. And if we need more evidence for surprises, then let's just turn towards a little bit further in the, in the, in the Gospel of Luke as we look at Mary's story. As I got to speak on hope a couple of weeks ago, I realized that hope is something that's meant to be borrowed that there's just seasons in our lives where we can't do it on our own. We can't muster up hope. You can't just snap your fingers and have hope in your hands and just feel it. And if you've ever gone through heartbreak or you've ever gone through loss, you know that to be true, right? Someone can't just say, well, I think you should feel better about it. It doesn't work that way. But I talked to a friend of mine that said, I believe hope needs to be borrowed. And, and her explanation was that in seasons where, where darkness had just overcome her, where it just had been really, really tough, she said, I just looked towards other people. And I latched on to their story. And I latched on to the faithfulness of God in their lives. And I latched on to what he was doing. And so I borrowed hope from them. And the beautiful thing about that borrowing is that I, I only borrowed it because I was supposed to give it to somebody else at some point too. And so as, as hope is borrowed and as we see Mary borrow hope in this story, a little context to what we're going we're gonna to dive into in a moment, Mary actually is told by Gabriel as well that she's going to have a child. 
surprise, right? Multiple surprises there. We've got, we've got a, a Mary, we've got Joseph that's extremely surprised. We've got his whole family that's surprised enough to not let them in, to not, not let them stay. These surprises in some way wreck plans too, right? But we have Mary being surprised. Surprised by the grace of God supplying her with a child. And she doesn't believe it at first. How can this be, for I am a virgin? That's what she says to Gabriel. How can this be? The question that everybody would be asking. How can this be? And Gabriel doesn't say, well, just believe. Gabriel doesn't say, well, God just got you. He doesn't say, well, Mary, you're a servant, and so you should just serve the Lord and know that it's going to be true. Gabriel says, Mary, go ask Elizabeth what happened to her. For she's been pregnant for six months. And so what does Mary do? Mary goes to the source through which Gabriel just told her to go to. That she needs to borrow hope, and so she's willing to go get it. And I gave this message a couple weeks ago, but if you need hope, and if you need to borrow it from somebody, my hope and my prayer is that you reach out to a friend over the phone. Knock on their door if they're next door to you. Listen to stories. Maybe they need to hear your own. Because Mary needed to hear Elizabeth's story in that time. When Mary was confused, not understanding, and scared, she needed to hear somebody's story. And I wonder if a lot of people in this world who are confused, not understanding, and scared need to hear your story, one that's filled with hope, because you know who bears that hope. So Elizabeth, so Mary is told to go see Elizabeth. And so Mary goes and runs to Elizabeth and knocks on the door and gets inside and the baby inside of Elizabeth leaps for joy and Mary knows in that moment that this is true, that the Lord's surprise is real, that her expectations have been shattered and guess what? She's at total peace with it. Because the surprise from the Lord is much greater than the expectations of ourselves. And it's something we're going to see in this season. And so what happens as Mary gets to the house, this joy uh, is, is just experienced. It literally says, and this is in verse 44, this is, we don't have this verse, but it says this in, uh, after she sees the, the baby. It says, Behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, and, the blessed, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Mary, you believed that the Lord would do it, and the evidence of it is that your joy is contagious. That my baby is leaping for joy because you're experiencing joy right now. Have we ever realized that joy is contagious? That joy is something that once we feel it, once we experience it, once we take hold of it, because it's far more than a feeling, it is something that other people around us also want to take part in. Joy. It's why when we gather in this space on Christmas usually, you, you lift up that candle and you just feel something different, right? You just feel something different. And it's not like just one person's feeling it. It's the entire room. That joy is contagious, and we see it in the Scripture. We also see that joy creates this sense of blessedness that's understood. That all of us in this room are extremely blessed. Understand that. There's not a person that's sitting in this room right now that God has not sent blessings upon in their life. I will argue that there are multiple times where we don't recognize blessedness, or we overlook blessedness where we overlook the favor of the Lord, where we overlook his hand in our life, where we overlook the things that he's doing. What I'm going to argue is that when, when Mary is surprised by God in this scenario, that joy overflows to the point where she can't hold it in. So if you're looking, this is in Luke 1, verses 46 through 56. This is Mary's song of praise. Some people, some Bible interpreters have, have uh, named this song the Magnificent. The Magnificent. And it says this, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. This is her response to understanding that the Lord's promises are true. This is the, the fact that she has been surprised, and this is her response to surprise. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. 
He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy as He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to His offspring forever and ever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So first point, joy is meant to be experienced in surprise. And if we want to experience surprise, then we need to eliminate expectation. That God has a surprise that's waiting for you. But if we're too stuck in our own schedule, if we're too stuck in our own calendar, if we're too stuck in our own plans, there's a good chance that surprise is going to be a corner we never turn around because we weren't seeking Him, we were seeking our own plans. But the second thing is that joy is contagious to the point of it being magnified for other people. What is that first verse? My soul magnifies the Lord, Mary says. Joy, the very essence of joy, someone who holds joy in their hands will magnify the Lord. That if you are joyous, that I promise you will be allowing others to see a clearer glimpse of who God is. The first thing that came to my mind, if I'm being honest with you, when I started thinking about magnifying anything was when I try and hand my phone over to my parents. Um, you see, I use the smallest font setting on, on the iPhones, and I know that by saying that out loud, I just created a lot of anxiety in this room. Um, I also know that my dad specifically had bought this special little lens, uh, kind of like those old bookmarks that people used to run across the pages, and some of you guys might know about those, right? Um, and, and my dad bought this, this little thing just to put over his phone so he can see it better, and I laugh because I'm young and I'm sure I'll be there eventually. Um, and I'm absolutely sure no one in this extremely vibrant service has, knows anything about those things, right? Um, but I just remember saying that, that for someone who can't see something and you try and show it to them without something that magnifies it, it is so unclear. And it almost just doesn't make sense. Hey, Dad, this is really, really cool. You should see this. Anthony, I can't see that. That's what you does one of these things. I can't, I can't look at that. And he just hands it back to me, right? You see, joy, though, on the other hand, hands something over to someone. And I want you to know that we have a faith that's very hard to describe. We have faith that's it's easy to share, but it's hard to, to decipher, right? Especially, it, it, we, we all think that we know, right? We, we come to this place where we're like, I'm confident in my faith, but then someone asks you, why is it? And then you're kind of lost for words. And we all do it. And it's because the best testimony you can have is the joy in your heart and the hope that you feel that they don't and the peace that you have that other people can't describe. Joy, in this instance, in my opinion, is a magnifier of the faith that we want to share. That if you tell someone something joyously, I do believe that they tune in more. If you tell someone something, someone something joyously, that they will be attuned with their hearts, that their eyes will see more clearly what it is that you're communicating. And I believe the same is true for Scripture. Even when we read Scripture, uh, getting the, the amazing opportunity of being in seminary, I get to take this class called the Public Reading of Scripture. And we're actually going to close the sermon today similarly because of that class. But the whole goal is that they want to teach pastors to read Scripture so well that they never have to preach. Not that that will ever happen, right? But, <laughs> but they want us to be able to read Scripture so well that we never have to preach. And the reason why is because this thing is alive. And it's living. It's a living Word of God, right? And what's the number one thing that people say about this Bible? What do we want to do to it? When you're in a Bible study, you ever hear someone say this? I just really want to dissect the Word today. You ever heard that statement? I had a mentor of mine absolutely blow my mind one day. He said, you know, we always say we want to dissect the Word. He goes, but if it's alive and breathing, he goes, you only dissect things that are dead. So what does it look like to read Scripture like it's alive? I believe it's to allow the joy, to allow the emotion, to allow what was happening inside of this thing when it was being written to be fully fleshed out. And in this scenario... The joy of Mary, I truly believe, if you can't feel it in her words right now, then you need to read it with a joyous heart. I also believe that in this time, Mary's song of praise was one that would be marked by joy. That was marked by joy because she had experienced a surprise. 
The goodness of God can come in experiencing the joy of somebody else. And that's what happens for Mary, that she goes to Elizabeth, experiences someone's joy. That joy is shared, and it is clear as day when Mary walks into the house, clear enough to where the joy would be contagious, clear enough to where the joy would be felt by her. And so she sings in response. Joy magnifies the Lord. So if joy, first off, is best sometimes experienced in surprise, and second off, joy is sometimes best experienced or, or is, is most um, effective at magnifying the Lord, then what else is there to, to do? What is it that we need to do to take hold of this joy? And I just had a quote I wanted to share with you. It's from C.S. Lewis. Um, there's a couple of quotes from C.S. Lewis that I want to share with you guys. But the first one is this. It says, You are wrong if you think that joy emanates only or principally from human relationships because God has placed it all around us. It is in everything and anything we might experience. We just have to have the courage to turn against our habitual lifestyle and engage in unconventional living. You see, what I really believe this quote is saying is that we have to, if we're going to get away from habitual lifestyle and we're going to partake in unconventional living, then it means that we've got to be a people that are willing to eliminate our expectations when we walk into scenarios. That we eliminate those, those expectations because what happens when expectations aren't met? The opposite of joy, right? We start to get saddened. We start to, to, to feel remorse. We start to feel doubt almost in some senses. And I believe that even more than a choice, joy is a whole perspective change in our lives. That joy is an attitude that allows us to see things differently. And I believe the healthiest people in the midst of this pandemic were the ones who came to me and didn't look at this and say, oh my gosh, this is going to be hard. This is going to be difficult. This is going to be the worst. This isn't going to be okay. They, looked, they were the people that looked at me and said, Mac, this is going to be new. And when a worldly perspective labels something as bad, a joyful perspective labels it as new. Do you know what it looks like to step into something new? compared to stepping into something bad. I believe what we walk in with looks different. The attitude that we walk into, the posture that we walk into that with looks different. And so maybe, just maybe, we have to have the courage to turn against our habitual lifestyle. That Whatever it is that we have kind of planned and said, this is the only way I will do things, that we have to eliminate that thought if we want to experience the surprise of Christ in our life because we have to be willing, like this quote said, to experience and engage in unconventional living. Where can your life see some more unconventional living? Maybe it's just being willing to be surprised. Maybe it's just being willing to be used. I think most often in my own life, it's just being willing to be available. I think I, 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 I focus so much on my faith sometimes. Am I able to do that? Lord, are you calling me to this? And I think more than anything, God's never calling us to be able. He's calling us to be available. And when we're available, what he will do with us is incredible. So are you available? And then there was another quote that I just want to share with you from C.S. Lewis as well. It says this. It says, Joy itself, considered simply as an event in my own mind, turned out to be no value at all. The value actually lay in that of which joy was the desiring. And that object, quite clearly, was no state of my own mind or body at all. We can't create joy for ourselves. Just remember that. You can't just joyfully start being joyful. <laughs> that joy has a source. It must be grasped from the hand of the Creator. It cannot be created on our own. We must grasp joy from the hand of the Creator. And the only way to do that is to be close. And so what happens in both of these scenarios? Both Elizabeth and Zechariah lean in when the Lord surprises them. Mary leans in when the Lord surprises her. That there is this dependency that they are called to in the midst of their joy. And so this joy is experienced in the dependency of God. This joy is shareable because of their dependency on God because they were willing to look at something and tell let me tell you right now Mary could have marked this news as bad and unfortunate that when she becomes pregnant lots of lots of bad things could have been looked at by her from from her family 
from people in the town, that she's now pregnant and they know that it's not Joseph's child, that the people in Joseph's family don't even let them stay in their houses. And that's why the, the story of Christ being born in a manger is even, even happens is because the family members, those closest to them, don't even want to be with them because they don't believe it. And so trust me, Mary could have sat in the situation and said, Lord, why have you done this to me? But she doesn't. She says, Lord, thanks be to you who did this for me. She's willing to not look at something in front of her that is far blown apart her plans and expectations as bad. She, turns, she labels this situation as new. And if God is in something new, then there is excitement to be had and there is joy to be had. And as I was finishing just thinking about the Advent story, thinking about Mary, thinking about Zachariah and Elizabeth, I just started to think, well, who else gets surprised in the gospel? And besides the fact that everybody gets surprised on the third day, I think the disciples especially feel surprised. And I, I want you to turn to this. This is in Luke 24, verses 38 through 42. And it says this, It says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Now, just to give you a little background, this is post-resurrection. This is the disciples gathering with one another. This is right after the Lord had just walked with two people on the road to Emmaus, right? That there is a group of people, the disciples, who were close to the Lord, who knew what he taught, knew what he was about, but they're sitting in this season where they haven't heard from him where they're hearing news from other people that possibly he has appeared to them and there's a doubt swirling in their mind, even though they know what the Lord told, him, told them when he was present with them, the moment that he was away, they start to doubt. And so we're, we're entering this scene where there, there's talking, there's kind of gossiping. Did you hear it? Maybe Jesus is back. Maybe he's not. I don't know about this. Did you hear who he told? I don't know if I really believe her, though. She's, would we trust her with the information that God really appeared to her? Can we believe this? There's a bunch of people that are just stressed and gossiping and not being very Christ-like in this situation. And God enters into the picture. And I just love that he walks in. Uh, and, and I don't know if you've ever had someone walk into a tense situation before that's just kind of joyous, but it catches everybody off guard. Uh, if you've ever been in an argument at your home and then maybe a, a, a child or a grandchild walks in and says, hey, uh, I feel like that's what Jesus does here because they're talking about these things. And Jesus walks in and he says, peace be with you. Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they, they had saw a spirit or saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you so troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. That is, that is I myself. Touch me and see. For the spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they, were, they still disbelieved for joy and, mar- they, and were marveling. That translation is kind of weird in the ESV, but what it really means is that while they still disbelieved, they felt joy and they were marveling. And he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I have spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures So the Lord enters into the picture. Christ comes back, and he doesn't do it in some eloquent way. He surprises them by walking through the front door in the midst of a situation where they're confused and puzzled. Surprise. Are you open to surprise? The disciples forget and need remembering. So if you're sitting in this room, and you've had seasons in this this time, in these last six months, where you've just been like, man, I feel like my faith should be stronger. I feel like I shouldn't be letting it beat me up as much. I feel like I shouldn't have forgotten all the faithfulness of God. I feel like every time that he reminds me, I feel guilt that I didn't remember. I want you to know right now that those who were closest to him forgot and needed remembering too. And I love that he walks in and he just surpri- his surprise is met with this absolute call towards remembrance, right? And he does the same thing on Emmaus. Anybody know the story of Emmaus, right? that he walks with these two guys that are talking about him and he's just entertaining it. I was describing this to a student the other day and I said, have you ever played uh, hide and seek with like a three-year-old? I was like, it's what Jesus is doing with the two people on Emmaus, right? Oh, what are you talking about? That's what he says, right? 
And it's the same thing. Like when, a, when, a, when someone, a, when you play hide and seek with a three-year-old, they're awful. They're not good at hide and seek, right? They hide behind things that you can see their feet. Uh, they want to be found, right? And so you sit there and you go there and like, oh, I wonder where they are, right? We entertain, we entertain it. Why do we entertain it though? Because we really want to have a relationship with that child. And so God's willing to just stoop down to our nonsensical level sometimes just to have a relationship with us. And he does it with them too. Hey, bozos, didn't you remember? I said I was going to do this. I said I was going to come again. I said you were going to experience three days and it was going to be tough. And I promised that afterwards it was going to be glorious. He calls them to remembrance and he brings them back through the scripture. So how can we, how can us as a congregation, us as a people, how can we be hope bearers and joy bringers in this Christmas season? I think it starts by what we talked about in the very beginning. Let's eliminate pessimistic expectations that we know the story, that we know what's happening, that we know what's going to be written better than an author of our lives does. And the only way that we can do that is to be open to surprises. Are you open to surprises? Or have you been living your life trying to predict, trying to to create, trying to be the one who knows the outcome? Because I believe that God doesn't want to be in the business of just serving that. He wants to be in the business of surprising us. And that every day has new opportunities, not just tough or different or difficult opportunities. Let's allow the surprises of God to be surprises that well up a deep joy that can't be created on our own. That song that we heard from Mary was not created on her own. That those words that flew, flew, was, were flowing from her lips were not of her own. That they were a joy that she had reached out and grabbed hold of from the Lord and had spoken over them. Have you ever had a scenario where you spoke and you know it wasn't yourself? You know the Lord was speaking for you. You know that He was intervening. You know that He was showing up. And it surprised you. Are we willing to be a people who allow that joy to surprise other people as well? And joy is the attitude, right? If hope is something that people are supposed to borrow, like I spoke about a couple weeks ago, then joy is the attitude through which it can be distributed. Joy powers the assembly line of hope. It's really, really hard to hand someone hope and not be joyful about it. Think about Christmas, the way that you hand someone a present. I'm almost more excited for people to open the present I've gotten them than I am to open the one they've gotten me. It's the beauty of gift giving, right? That joy powers the assembly line of hope. So let's grab hold of that joy that only has one source. And when a worldly perspective labels something as bad and unfortunate, let's be a people that have a joyful perspective that labels it new. There are so many neighbors of yours. There are so many family members of yours. There are so many people that are in close proximity to you that just need to hear that this season is going to bring about new opportunity, not just difficult situations. Because that's what we just keep saying. Oh, it's been tough, it's been weird, it's been hard, and that's true, and I don't want to discredit that. And I know for a lot of you guys in this room that that is really, really true, and that it hits close to home, and I don't take it lightly. But what would it look like? And how could God surprise us if we would just start looking at it as new? new opportunities for new mercies to be received and new joys to be brought. So what do you need to remember? Where do you need to release your own expectations and wait with joyous anticipation on the Lord to do what He has promised in our lives? The relinquishing of suffering, the bringing of peace, and the handing over of joy for all of us to share. I want to close just by reading Mary's song one more time. And if you guys would, I just want to encourage you to close your eyes and let this song, let this, this song that is birthed out of God surprising someone in a way that they could have never imagined with a gift that was going to bless the entire world. That's the type of joy that I want to grab hold of. And so my hope and my prayer is that her song becomes your song today. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God who's far more than just my God. He is my Savior. For He has looked upon the humble estate of His servant. He has looked upon me and marked me His. For behold, from now on, 
all generations will understand my blessedness that I wish to share with them. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and is holy in his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those to a humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. Lord, help me to be hungry. And the rich he has sent away. For he has helped his servant Israel, and he has helped me. It was in remembrance of his mercy and in remembrance of his goodness as he spoke to our fathers, as he spoke to those before us, as he spoke to our offspring, his words will speak forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being a Lord who values surprising us. Lord, that values us enough to want to surprise us. And Lord, I pray for those in this room, myself included, who are just so stuck in wanting a specific way, that are just so stuck in wanting a specific schedule, that are just so stuck in wanting a, a specific perspective, that are just so stuck in wanting a specific calendar, and wanting a specific schedule, Lord, that you would take our specifics and just explode them with surprise. Lord, that you surprised a lot of people as they were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. You surprised Zechariah and you surprised Elizabeth by giving them the joy of a child. You surprised Mary by letting her be the very facet through which the Savior would enter the picture. And you surprised everyone by not coming in glory and in majesty, but by coming in swaddling clothes. Lord, let us not forget that what you did and how you entered this picture was far different than any of us could have expected. So let's eliminate the expectations in the present now. Let's eliminate that we think we know how you're going to work tomorrow and let's be open to the newness that you're providing today. Lord, I believe that you want to surprise us and I pray that we would be open to the surprise. Lord, fill us with joy. Allow us to borrow hope. Allow us to experience peace. And Lord, I pray that we would wrap all those things up so that we can gift it to those who need it most. And Lord, for those of us right now, that's us. So would we receive the gifts that you are pouring upon us and would we receive that joy? Would it well up inside of us? And Lord, out of the overflow, would we wrap, would we put together, and would we hand over so much joy to the world outside of this place? We love you so much. It is in your incredible name. It is in your glorious name. It is in your joy-filled, victorious name that we pray. Amen.
if today you felt as if you needed to be reminded or you came in contact and said, I want more of that joy and you want to say yes to him, there are yes bags on the way out. But as we leave, I just want to leave you with one last quote from C.S. Lewis. He helped me a lot in this message. Um, Because I think it's something that we need to, to remember. It says this, All joy reminds. It is never a possession, always a desire for something longer ago or further away, or something that's still about to be. If you're going to leave in any posture today, leave remembering. Leave remembering that God's goodness and joy is, ex- is readily available. And leave remembering that if something is further away or about to be, then that means joy is possibly right around the corner in a way that God just wants to surprise us with. Let's be open to that and let's show the world what that looks like.